uh, in looking at the work that the Bible translators have been doing for decades, uh, I saw a tremendous potential payoff within biblical studies to address questions um, that the grammarians haven't really been able to address because they're operating above the sentence level or they seem to be uh, accomplishing things that, that were mismatched with English or whatever it would be. And so um, the translators were describing languages uh, from a functional standpoint and cognitive linguistics is a signal, uh, significant way of, of adding to that in terms of better understanding how different features affect cognitive processing and slowing things down, directing our attention and such. Cognitive linguistics um, is significant in that I, I actually came out of Hebrew Bible. Um, both my degrees are focused on uh, in biblical Hebrew. And I, uh, after reading Adele Berlin's Poetics and Interpretation of Bib Biblical Narrative, uh, she won my heart. And I, uh, I, I thought I would never go back. But as I got into my MA defense, um, I did an analysis of uh, the failure at I in, in Joshua chapter seven and eight. Um, and one of my examiners said, Steve, this, this all looks great. Uh, we're convinced, but how is someone else supposed to do this? Because so much of the poetic analysis was based on essentially intuit, intuition or what at the time was called reader response. Um, and that haunted me for about four years trying to figure out, well, how, how can I do that? And for the people who are not into, you know, not as intuitive, the, the accountant and banker types engineers. Um, and I realized that, um, there's data there. It's just that it's difficult without a framework to recognize what those data points are and then how to make sense of them. And that's when I started, uh, stumbled across, um, uh, a, a volume, edited volume, um, like linguistics and Biblical Hebrew from a conference in 19, 1993 in Dallas and started reading my way into that and started realizing that a lot of the kinds of questions or things that had been answered as though it was stylistic variation uh, or we don't really know or emphasis uh, these these vague kinds of explanations that they were actually principles driving things and that's why certain features could ha bring about reproducible results um, and not just in Greek or in English or in Hebrew, but cross-linguistically, because it's not just, uh, it's a human cognition thing, not a Greek thing or an English thing, though there are differences and, and idiosyncrasies and things in, in different languages. In the, uh, the, what's called the parable of the, the rich fool, um, we have a, a number of different things to, to slow down, slow down the story right at a key point. Uh, we have this narrative introduction about um, this man has all kinds of, has a, has a huge harvest, doesn't know what to do with it, or does, has a rich harvest, has, an, has something that's, that's greater than he can store in his barns. And so the question is, what's he going to do with this excess? Um, and he, you actually stop and he has a, a rhetorical question, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And that's basically the, that rhetorical question actually allows the audience to kind of ask the same thing. Like for it's the equivalent of us saying, what would we do if we won the lottery? If we, if we had that, that extra money or the, you know, if you're on a salary, the, the third paycheck that comes along every once in a while in the American system. Um, and then there's actually another pause because there's a er narrative interruption that said, um, and, and he said, Kaipin. so you have, uh, not just the rhetorical question, but you have a statement from the narrator that causes uh, another, because it's, it basically breaks up what would have been uh, one speech into two. And then he says, this I will do. It's a forward pointing reference, which is another delay and it's, it's another one hand, forward. but also being able to, to not just say, well, this is Luke, Luke and style or uh, these kinds of things, but to be able to point to data in cognitive linguistics and uh, in, that have been done in, um, labs where they've measured eye movement and things that, that redundant information, uh, re even redundant noun phrases can have the same kind of effect of, of slowing things down and uh, giving us more time to process. People working in textual criticism have been very interested in discourse grammar because there aren't any good reason, uh, good rationales for evaluating those kinds of things. It's 
Um, you know, you can have the, the wider geographic distribution or earlier reading and harder reading and those kinds of things, but actually discourse grammar brings in a, a rich set of tools for determining the harder readings. You better understand what those things are accomplishing. Um, and also another area of uh, people have been interested is in Septuagint studies because the translation technique idea, they, they can say that there's a tendency to do this, but quite often they can't explain why. And that's led to some of the division about whether this is a slavish, you know, slavish translation or, or something else. But um, in the field of narratology, it looks like a very promising area because it's taking what the, the great work that's been done in, in poetics um, and especially with, with concepts like focalization. And it's, it's really, the, there's a potential under that, the, the rubric of, of focalization to, to bring in insights on viewpoint to be able to, to better understand things looking at how that affects human cognition and in the processing of the story.